start that. So welcome to the evening um, and welcome to our online Wellspring Alberta house. Um, my name is Nikki and I'm so pleased that you could join us for tonight's speaker ses session on how understanding your brain can empower your life on a cancer journey with Rob, Dr. Rob Rutledge. Um, tonight's session is a part of our new Integrative Oncology Speaker Series and a collaboration between Wellspring Alberta and the Action Center. I do want to start with uh, land acknowledgements. Um, our health and well-being are connected to the land and to the environment that surrounds us. We acknowledge that we live, the land we share, live, and learn on are the traditional territories in Alberta of Treaty 6, Treaty 7, and Treaty 8, Métis settlements, and the six regions. This is the home of many First Nations, Métis and Inuit. Here at Wellspring, we are both settlers and Indigenous, and we pay tribute to those whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Wellspring acknowledges the traditional healing pathways and the knowledge of our interconnectedness with the land as gifts provided by the elders and knowledge keepers. Um, for those who are new to our community, Wellspring Alberta is a charitable organization that provides a comprehensive range of programs, resources, and support. So anybody living with any type of cancer and their caregivers can improve the quality of their lives. These programs are offered free of charge and without referral. We do not receive any government funding and are supported solely by the generosity of our community. Our speaker series of which tonight is part is open to the public. So always feel free to welcome and invite your friends and family to any future speakers. Our mission is no one has to face cancer alone. We ask that people's stories stay here since not everyone has shared their cancer diagnosis with others. And we hope you enjoy the program tonight. Um, we do welcome your feedback and we do launch a poll at the end of the presentation um, so that Wellspring can continue to learn and provide programs that are relevant and meaningful. So very quickly, Dr. Rob Rutledge is I'm going to say an old friend of Wellspring, Alberta at this point. Um, he is a radiation oncologist with the Nova Scotia Health Authority and Queen Elizabeth II Health Sciences Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So he's joined us quite late in the evening for his time. Thanks, Rob. Um, and he treats prostate, breast, and pediatric cancers. He is also the clinical lead for the PC PEP program. So, Rob. Welcome back to the online Alberta world. And with Thank that, I'll you. pass it over to you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Hats off to each and every one of you that are attending right now. You can make a tremendous difference in your life or if you're watching uh, this video afterwards. Really, the science has come so far in terms of how our thoughts, our emotions, how we think, how we perceive actually have a tremendous influence on the physicality of our body. And so you can actually influence your outcomes in some sense. So um, I'm really hoping that I'm going to provide you with some practical advice. I think you're going to be shocked by some of the information I'm about to provide. Uh, but it really is very, very powerful the way that you can actually influence how your brain works and therefore how your life works. This is what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, just the overview of complete cancer care, but we're going to talk about how you can stay in the best part of your brain more often, which is your frontal lobe, the happier, more clear thinking, more confident, more peaceful you. How, how do you do that? And then the more shocking parts is around these ideas, the scientific updates on what it is that you can do to influence brain function and your emotional world, your emotional life. Uh, and then we're going to finish off with a very lovely technique that we all want to kind of practice in the day-to-day, -day, which is staying in that positive state of mind more often. So you go back there more easily, more quickly and, and change your perception of the world. I've been thinking about this whole issue of cancer and, and people who've had a cancer diagnosis and what they want afterwards. Obviously, we want to maximize our chance of cure or have great longevity if that's not possible in terms of cure. So that's it's pretty obvious that that's kind of number one. However, there are other goals really that people have. 
And it's, you know, a cancer diagnosis can be very stressful. And so how can we feel better emotionally? How can we feel more grounded, more confident, more clear thinking, more uh, at peace, right? So that's probably what a lot of people want. They want to feel better so they can enjoy their lives more. And then they want to be able to function better. And so how do you get your brain to function better before, during, and after your treatments to think more clearly, to have your body function at a higher level, right? And this is one integrated package, one holographic package. We do that to serve the greater goals in your life. And the greater goals could be for you to connect more deeply, more deeply with your loved ones, or more deeply with yourself, more deeply with life itself, right? So we start to think higher purpose, why are we alive? Why do we want to feel better? Why do we want to be stronger? And some people can even reframe and understand from a kind of spiritual perspective that the cancer journey can offer an opportunity to grow psychologically and spiritually, right? And so you can kind of bump yourself up in a kind of a level of uh, consciousness through this journey. So I want to kind of tap into some of those ideas because your brain is the the medium or the filter which with you perceive the world, you connect with the world. And so if your brain functions better, then your mind functions better, you make better decisions and you're more connected to what's truest for you. So really this brain, that that kind of tissue between your ears is so incredibly important. And so we want it to function better. And so in service of that, I offer this talk. Complete cancer care. So I call it integrative oncology. I have a fantastic center there now in the Calgary region that also kind of uh, taps you into that space. So it's the best of the medical system. And that has a whole set of uh, knowledge and attitudes and behaviors, how to advocate for yourself, how to get the best possible care there. Starts with understanding, obviously. And then the integrated part is what else you can do to empower yourself. And when you empower yourself, you get better care. But anyways... Uh, so the physicality of it. So I think of it as um, artificially as body healing of the mind, meaning this is what we're going to kind of work with tonight because the, the brain is also at the level of the body. And lastly, nurturing the spiritual perspective. So th it's the marriage of those two that gives you the best chance of recovery and to be the healthier, happier you. So it's one holographic perspective. I'm tapping into many excellent authors. One of them is Rick Hansen, who uh, taught me about this idea of neuroplasticity and how your brain continues to grow and learn and what you practice in your day to day is what you become good at. So if you practice being nervous, flustered, scared, and you know, overwhelmed, you get good at that. If you practice being centered, calm, clear thinking, you know, compassionate, you get good at that. The same external environment is happening. Uh, but you will be more um, more at peace and you'll probably make better decisions and you'll enjoy your life better and your family members will probably like you a little bit better too. So it's this whole idea of changing the neurochemistry, neurocircuitry, because your brain does change and adapt with time. That's the guarantee is that you will continue to change your brain with time. In some sense, it's a choice. In some sense, you can be deliberate with this. In, in some sense, you reverse engineer how you want your brain to function at its highest level. Now, yes, we're not going to do that purpose per, perfectly, but if, there's this idea of kind of changing it for the good. So thank you, Rick, and your tremendous teachings uh, around that. So I think it from an evolutionary perspective so 600 million years ago, the, the organisms got complex enough to have a nervous system, meaning sensing and acting kind of motor and sensory uh, sides of this, and then became more and more and more complex. And I think of it like building a house, you set down a first uh, floor foundation, you build the next floor on top of that, next floor on top of that, even to the point where 2.5 million years ago, it was the humans or the pre-humans were complex enough to be making tools and yet their brains were only one third the size so what did we do with the next two thirds well uh it's actually around socialization and tribal and you know being part of a team and we are so wired to be part of a team you can put up your finger if you have green blue uh, or hazel eyes and if you put up your finger you are a mutant because there were no people like that prior to six thousand years ago and then there was one person, I think, in the Denmark area who had blue eyes and became very popular and had lots of progeny. So you're probably one of those 
no doubt. Anyways, we are wired, wired for being part of a tribe and connecting and protecting our own. And I think about the three levels of the brain, the reptilian, the limbic system, I call it's called the stress brain, and then your very human neomammalian uh, brain. And it maps onto three systems though. So the, the kind of reptilian brain is the avoid. It's like what gets you to jump away from a, a car that's coming over the curb at you. And this really is happening so fast you can't control it so and then the next level is the the reward seeking system really sex and food but it gets you off the couch you know each each of these has its purpose and then the attachment the connection the uh the uh, the human to human and this is uh, a very complex thing that we can tap into at all. That is also the part of your brain you want to live out, uh, live uh, amongst. Otherwise, each system draws on the other systems for its own ends. Okay, so the one of the major things I want you to think about is this whole idea of flipping your lid ah when you're stressed. Okay, it's a hand model of the brain. Wrist is spinal cord. Base of thumb is the reptilian brain, right? The avoid, the scared brain. Uh, the thumb, the rest of the thumb itself is your limbic system. I also call it the stress brain or the irritable brain. And then your very smart, very compassionate, very caring frontal lobe wraps over top of that. And the takeaway is that you want to stay in your frontal lobe as much as possible. And yes, you will ah flip your lid sometimes during the day. It happens. It's normal. Two things. We want you to get back earlier and more quickly, more confidently, more and being more resilient. But the resilience piece is that you can get yourself into a state of mind where the water you know, washes off your back and you don't flip your lid as easily, right? And so how do we stay engaged? How do we stay in our frontal lobe, which is the best version of you, that compassionate, caring, connected, loving you? So that's Essentially, that's the that's the talk is how can you get that brain tissue to be wired here and stay less like, ah, oh, this is tough. I'm I'm stressed. I'm flustered. I'm scared. This is all normal, but we want to come back home more quickly. Okay. The first thing I think about is actually being deliberate about how you want to be in this world. As I said before, practice those states of the mind, the states of mind become traits of character, right? So if you practice being more centered, calm, clear thinking, you become more, you like become that type of person more often. We're not going to do it perfectly. And we're going to have a predispositions to our personalities, but what is it you want to manifest? I think it needs to be deliberate because otherwise you get blown this way and that, and you get distracted. A lot of distractions these days. And we forget what's most important to you. How do you want to be in this world? How do you want to let, let your love out and to shine and to sh you know shine your light in your corner of the of the universe? When you connect with that next person, whether it's in the elevator or in the grocery store or at the cancer center, right? How is it that you want to be in this world? And so be be deliberate about that. Understand that you can practice, you can think, you can remember, and then you can choose to do that. And so I think about practicing a routine, which we're about to practice together. So I do this first thing in the morning with my wife. We usually you're using our uh, biofeedback monitor meditating for eight to 10 minutes. At the end of that, I'm saying a prayer. It happens to come out in secular terms, like something like, please help me be kind and compassionate and helpful. Do whatever is best for everybody concerned. So I'm really kind of saying a prayer to myself hoping that that can follow me throughout the day, that I can interact with people in that state of mind. I'm practicing. I'm praying that I can do that. I'm asking for help that I can be my best version of myself, right? So it's very deliberate. It's very clear about how I want to live in this world. So that's the setting of the intention. You also notice going into a tough situation, right? You're about to go into your doctor's office visit, or you're about to have a difficult conversation with your family members, a family member, for instance. Um, again, remembering what's most important before you go in. I'm going to advocate for myself when I go into my medical appointment. It, the, the care is about me. I'm going to make sure I get my questions answered. I'm going to work with my physician, recognizing my physician has a personality. 
and I want to get the best care from this person. So you remember, you remember, you remember going into a tough situation. And lastly, which is hardest, right? So we are going to lose it sometimes like, ah, oh, I'm flustered. I'm out of control. This is too much, uh, that type of thing. And then you remember, okay, this is how I want to live my life. I want to come back home. I want to manifest what's most important to me. Right, guys? So, so that's all just a big warm up to say, let's be conscious and uh, deliberate about how we want to manifest. I'm going to take you through probably three minute exercise. You do it in a way that's best for you. Um, you don't have to do this exercise, but I think it's helpful. We do mindfulness for maybe about a minute or so. And then we uh, do a visualization, sending love to yourself and to others ultimately. Uh, and then we come back home. So, okay. I like, if you would do it in a way that feels good for you. I like coming off the back of the chair. So I'm not leaning or slumping again, but you can do it any way you want. If you want to slump back, that's fine. But I do like the kind of upright posture. It's like you're giving yourself a sense of strength, a sense of nobility, a sense of you're, you're taking your seat, you're taking control of your life in that moment. I'm, this is my moment to set my intention. Feet flat on the floor if you want, hands on the knees. Relatively straight spine, and feeling like the top of the head is being drawn towards the heavens. Strength, nobility. Now you bring your consciousness into your body, into your feet, into your hands and your knees, into your spine, that strong spine. You're solid, there's a solidness to your character, to your, you're grounding yourself with your consciousness now. Bring your attention to the front of your chest. What do you feel? Like with a sense of curiosity, what does that feel like? Middle of your chest or the front of your chest, that kind of sense of openness or warmth or vulnerability or a loving kindness. Hmm? Let's focus on a few breaths now. Be very curious. What does it feel like to breathe? Without thinking it, just experience it. And take a longer, slower, smoother out breath. A nice, slow out breath. You can increase the depth of your breathing just a little bit, a slightly bigger in breath and a slow, smooth out breath with curiosity. Curiosity also has a sense of kindness. Very nice, very, very nice. Okay, now the visualization, allow your heart to warm, sense of compassion or caring. It's like you're turning on the element of a stove and allowing that warmth to be generated in the middle of your chest and allow that to radiate. And think of somebody that you love or maybe a pet or at a different time in your life and you felt really connected maybe with your kids or a parent or grandparent. And allow your heart to warm, to open, to send that love to that person that pet. Now think of somebody who's suffering in some way or form. And again, send your love to them right from your heart, from your heart into their heart. Maybe somebody close to you, maybe somebody at a distance. Just imagine that they get some sense of relief from you sending that wonderful warmth to them. Think of your friends and family members and cherished colleagues. And as every memory of that, those people come to mind, just allow your heart to open and send that love to each and every one of them. You're like a beacon of light. You're warm, healing energy projecting outwards. Send your compassion, your caring to everybody who's joined the call tonight throughout Alberta. Let them learn and grow. Let them find healing in whatever is way be is best for them. 
and send that energy out again to everybody in Alberta who's been diagnosed with cancer. Limitless compassion, you're like a beacon of light, warm, radiant energy going outwards to everybody in Canada, everybody around the world. Mm. Pray for peace in the Middle East. Let that emanate elsewhere. And recognizing that as a beacon of light, you're also radiating beautiful healing energy into your own tissues. Every single cell in your body is being washed over with this healing energy. And in that space, set an aspiration for yourself. How is it that you want to heal? How is it that you want to grow? What is it that you need to learn? What's your next step in your journey? Real sense of compassion. How do you want to be in this world? And let it be so. Release any sense of grasping or trying to get anything. Come back simply to the state of being as you are right now. This perfect moment where everything happens, the love, the connection happens in this moment, the growth, the learning, always back to this moment. Feeling connected with the floor, sense of groundedness with the earth, being supported by the earth. And a, an understanding that there's um, an openness, a, a space above you that represents transformation and healing, possibility. The unmanifested, that's you're also part of that. So you're part of very pragmatic earth and you're part of a incredible opportunity here as well and that your good human heart connects those two connection and aspiration and you now can let go of all your meditations you can come back to whatever is comfortable for you and i'm just going to turn off the garden <laughs> power here we're making some greens in our house i think i'm just going to turn off the uh the water here, two seconds. There, you can even have a little stretch if you like. Stretch into your spot, stand up, whatever's good for you. Okay. That's important. The, the frame of reference, what's most important to you is important as you go forward and learning because it's 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 the best way to grow. It's the, actually the best way to learn is to be in this kind of open, positive state and also very compassionate towards yourself that we're not going to be perfect in our journey. We're going to learn and we're going to keep on bouncing back, reframing, looking for the positives. Okay. You're going to learn a lot about inflammation uh the idea i'm just gonna grow that back there the idea is that if your tissue is irritated particularly your gut but also your brain if you have an inflammatory lifestyle if you're constantly feeling stressed if you are tapping into social media that's irritating you stretch stressing you it actually releases those stress chemicals causing inflammation and damage to the body so more and more that science is coming out. So there's opportunity then, therefore, to live in a more peaceful state. But inflammation causes irritation of the tissues that can prime cancer cells and cause a whole bunch of things to happen, including not being able to think as well and including kind of emotional lability. So we want to have less inflammation or appropriate inflammation within the body. So that's one of the, one of the key principles here is the anti-inflammatory lifestyle. And we, touch is also healing, right? So I'm going to go through the practical stuff, but you can actually, even right now, just give your hand a rub. Your hand doesn't know if it's you who's rubbing it or not, right? Or your face. Just a sense of kind of kindness. We're kind of social beings. Touch ourselves. To be out in nature, or to even to look at the sky, even in the cold day, right? Whatever it is that nourishes your soul and gets you into that space. 
can also help with that kind of sense of connection, sense of peace, which is anti-inflammatory. Okay, so this is motherhood stuff. I know it. I just want to give you kind of the science, some of the scientific update, right? So if you're more active, you're more likely to experience that sense of gratitude and hope and love and peace, right? And it will protect you against the depression and anxiety, which is a normal part of life. So by simply changing the chemistry in your brain, brain by exercise and being active, you actually change your perception there. There's some really interesting data, what, what they call myokines. Myokines are the chemicals that are released by the muscles when you exercise your muscles. But if you don't exercise, if you don't use those muscles, you, you lose out on the dozens of chemicals, a whole po polypharmacy of chemicals that are secreted into your bloodstream when your muscles move and are activated. So I really highly endorse it. Um, and that has a huge influence on literally every system in the body. For me, it's like, it's the want to live chemicals. I'm still exercising, therefore my tribe wants me. Somehow those chemicals are going to keep me alive. Kills off cancer cells. I'm not going to go through that physiology. Primes the immune function. But what I am going to say is, They've also been called the molecules of hope because it instantly um, has an anti-anxiety and a motivational system. And you learn brain-derived growth factor. You exercise, the chemicals are there. It's like, you're moving, I better pay attention, I better learn, is what the, what the evolutionary perspective had. But even lactic acid, you know, you think about lactic acid, the, you get the burning feeling in your muscles, even low levels of lactic acid when you don't experience any burning, goes to your brain immediately and you feel like, ooh, more calm. Like, like I'm doing something uh, to help myself, right? And so, and then there's rewiring. So I was talking about the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe gets more preferentially wired when you're actually exercising. And look at this, the, this frontal lobe overlaps or um, what they call dampens the irritable stress brain. It kind of says, okay, little buddy, you're okay. I'm taking care of you right? So your frontal lobe is stronger. You're less likely to feel irritated, more likely to see uh, the challenge response. You just have the same external circumstance, but you're like more willing to kind of take on the challenge. Quicker recovery from depression. It's like those chemicals, it's like, that's it. It's the happy hormones. Exercise produces the happy hormones. Okay. So some, um, some, um, a little bit of science around the exercise bit. So Kelly McGonigal is a Stanford uh, professor. I just, I love her books. Upside of Stress is one of them that I really, really, really like, but she talked about the joy of movement. So even what she said is three minutes of exercise changes the kind of energy and mood in your body. So think about it. You can put on a YouTube um, you know, video of some song from your youth that you really like and dance to it in the kitchen. It's pretty darn easy, right? And that will change your mood and decrease your anxiety. And so I would say um, um, like that's, that's like an automatic hack. Three minutes, that's pretty easy. Now, I love, just, I love this. Um, this is obviously one of the pandemic, <laughs> pandemic books, but I do just kind of like the picture as well. So how do you, is that you can increase three minutes later, how do you actually increase the, that benefit of feeling better? Add music. That's why I'm thinking about the YouTube uh, music video from your youth type thing. So more enthusiasm, more joy. Like, why aren't we experiencing more joy? I, I'm guilty of that one. It's like, I'm so serious, working so hard, but why not experience joy? It's a good space to be in. And then if you do exercise with others, really what they're saying here is that you suddenly don't see your you know, like the me story, the kind of I'm stuck in me story, you got to see, oh, this is the human condition. This is how people get along. So that's the kind of self-transcendence, Pete. And then you can see this opportunity because if you're with other people, you're always going to have an influence on them. You share your love with them in some way or form. You listen to them, you care for them. It is going to be beneficial to you as well. So, and then lastly, so uh, get outside as, as I was saying, just seeing the natural light, see, uh, you know, seeing the natural trees, for instance, is very healing. So three minutes and then these kind of tweaks on top of it. Okay, so then the next level is if you can work relatively hard for 20 minutes, 
it changes the biochemistry within your brain so that you will be um, get a kind of long term, longer term benefit. So I think about it as working out first thing in the morning and feeling a lot less anxious for the rest of the day. So that's it's very very positive. So all the endorphins, endocannabinoids, yes, that is quite related to CBD. You know what we're talking about here. Helps you persist getting things done, persisting through pain, increased energy, less self-doubt. Look, it is it is the reset. I'm not going to harp any further on that one. You also can feel more connected because the idea is from an evolutionary perspective is like once you work super hard to gather your berries or super hard and we're you know, part of a kill of an animal, the tribes that were willing to share were more likely to uh, succeed. And so we are the we are the products of that sharing tribe. And so when we work hard, we want to share, we want to connect, we feel more pro-social after we exercise. And then I like this um, hack as well, is to see it as a symbol of something good, right? So your symbol could be when you're lifting those weights, it's like, I have strength, I feel my own power, right? So that's the the, the turn or the perceptive um, change. Or power walking, I'm making, I'm on my journey, I'm taking a step on my journey, I can persist, I can take on a challenge, right? So you're understanding the symbols of your life to represent your psychological journey. So what do we say? Exercise 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Actually, it's up now 300 minutes per week. More is better, obviously, up to a um, limit. Strength training, I'm going to talk about specifically because that has its own benefits, flexibility, coordination, blah, blah, blah. Fitness is number one. So how do you do it? <clears throat> how do you trick yourself into actually exercising, moving, physical activity? We are human. If it's fun, you don't have to go to the gym. There's a hundred different ways to do some exercise. Make it social, maybe even have a little contract with a friend or so, create a routine. So it's not a question. I come home from work. I'm going to go do my power walk or, you know, hit some tennis balls. I'm going to do something, you know, no matter what. It's like, it's beyond contemplation there. But ultimately you have to move your body. It's just like, there's a, there's a place for discipline in this life. And the discipline is to make sure that you take care of yourself, that you actually do the work. Obviously you're super tired during chemo and you know, there's circumstances where you have to be smart about it. You have a limited amount of energy, et cetera, et cetera. But for the most part, most people do the work. It's like a mega message from your spirit to your body saying, I want to get better. Okay. Okay. So in addition to aerobic cardiovascular training. If you do strength training, you get extra benefits. So this is beyond cardiovascular to actually build some muscle. So you have to, to build the muscle, you got to actually strain the muscle. And it's interesting because for instance, if you did like um, upper body work, your actually lower body would get a little bit stronger as well because there's, there's neurophysiology allows the whole system to get stronger. So you're less likely to have suffer an injury. You get better faster. Again, uh, the, the bones and muscles and even the, um, the bone density actually gets better. If you strength train, strain the muscles a little bit, um, releases the growth factor. And there's lots of other benefits. I could talk about the heart stuff and, and diabetes and metabolism and weight loss, all that stuff. This is strength training in addition to aerobic exercise or strength training as part of aerobic exercise, but it definitely increases the brain activity. We think more clearly, we learn more easily. Again, in addition to the aerobic stuff, decreases uh, dementia. And there's the mood part of it as well, right? So those myokines released from the muscles has these effects. So really we want to integrate strength training in addition to the cardiovascular stuff. And yes, do it in a way that's fun for you. Get expert advice. I'm imagining Wellspring Alberta has got the kind of resources to kind of tap you into different types of classes. You are going to get some soreness in the muscles, right? And so we're at the start, you're kind of working yourself up 30 minutes twice per day. You're using all those major muscle groups. 
Uh, it's two sets. So eight to, eight to 12 reps, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, give yourself a rest and you do it again. So you're doing enough to uh, do that. This is our workout A. Uh, so it's a whole body workout using um, elastic bands and body weight, essentially, uh, as part of the cancer PEP program. Okay, next is not sitting too much, right? So even if you have a good workout, even strength training, but you're sitting for hours and hours in a day, you have lost a lot of benefits, sadly to say. So it's essentially it's sitting. I think that's the way to kind of uh, think about that. Uh, what's too much sitting? It's probably two to three hours in a row uh, at a time. It's probably not uh, healthy for you. So five on the hour, stand up for five minutes on the hour. In fact, if you guys can just stand up right now for me, stretch. Uh, and then I'll just go through this. You can kind of look down at your screen, maybe um, there. So increase all, all, all cause mortality. Cancers increased. If an activity increases the risk of cancer, then you want to stop that activity after you get a cancer diagnosis. Diabetes, um, uh, cardiovascular disease. Here it is. Too much sitting is bad. And you can see the guy in the middle here and they're talking about all the poor ac muscle activity. Your brain's not being engaged as much. The, uh, the lining of your blood cells. And then that distributes to every single organ in your body. And then ultimately in the outer circle is all the potential long-term side effects of not getting up five minutes on the hour. So really... Sitting is the new smoking. I think I actually have a, sl a slide on, on that uh, issue, right? So it changes all these kind of the chemistry within your body. Your brain function slows. So it's the opposite exercise. You're kind of perking up to the world, sitting too often. Your, your body's actually trying to conserve some energy, slowing down there. So there's that study. You six, sit straight for six hours per day. You're losing... 4.8 years of life or 28 minutes for every hour, 21 minutes. Okay, so how do you sit less? So this is the, the practicality. It's like the loving action, the loving, the sword, the, the sword that says, yes, this is how I can do it. Uh, you know, lots of different watches have this kind of stand up alarm, five minutes on the hour. Uh, I like this uh, ritual. If I'm talking on the phone, I really try. If I'm, if I'm not too, too tired, I try to stand up while I'm talking. There's no reason why I can't. I walk the stairs today to get up to the sixth floor. Uh, stand up desk. So you start out mm, three minutes, five minutes per hour of just standing, you, using your email. Slowly as the weeks, even months go by, you get stronger and stronger and stronger. So it's not so hard to do. You get kind of different muscles in your system. So sitting is really important. Okay, so let's just stretch once more. Uh, cause I, I talk about this stuff and then I, I don't do it. So it's like looking away from the computer screen up at the sky. Oh yeah. And kind of a sense of appreciation for your body, right? And stretch or shake in a way that's right for you. You kind of get your energy back into your body, right? Look for those opportunities and then share. Like you're part of a community. You're, you're, Others will learn from you. We influence by model, model that good behavior. And that will prevent more cancers. Okay, diet. Obviously, what we eat has a profound influence on brain function. There's just no if, ands, or buts about it. I want to kind of give you the overview, recognizing this is like an hour 10 talk uh, just by itself, uh, one, one hour, 10 minute talk. So the antioxidants are mopping up the damaging chemicals, which are the inflammatory chemicals. That's why the fruits and vegetables are really good. Uh, we don't want the sugary drinks. I didn't focus on sugary drinks, but it's like it's super obvious that you you just don't um, function well with those kind of high levels of sugar in your system. Either when the sugars are going up, this is the glucose, fructose, you know, sugary number number two sugar uh, substance on the the, the food list. The sugary stuff gets in and then your body responds by trying to get the sugar into the cells. So insulin-like growth factor 
is release that primes cancer growth. It's not good for your brain to eat the sugary stuff. And we're talking like fruit juice. We're talking pop. We're talking sports drinks. It's, those are all chemicals that are just not good for you. So we're trying to change the soup, which changes the, uh, the way the cancer cells can grow. If you take care of yourself, it actually improves your immune function. Take care of yourself and get through your treatments more easily, right? So here are the principles. This is the motherhood stuff, right? Eat plants, sorry, eat food, not chemicals, mostly plants, not too much more on that in a moment. Start out maybe by eating your veggies first. What a good idea that would be. And that would fill you up more quickly. Complex carbs. Carbs are not bad. It's just that you don't want the kind of processed stuff, the, sh the, sh the sugary quick quick carbs. You want slow burn carbs. Proteins, you're going to get enough protein from essentially a, a vegetarian type of diet. So limit the amount of meat, especially less red meat. Fiber is so incredibly important uh, for your gut health. It has to be soluble fiber, i.e. from whole plants, not the added fiber that they advertise. It's not the same thing. You want the whole plant fiber. Am I getting emphatic for you? I like lots of different types of foods at each meal because there's this combination, the synergy of the, the micronutrients uh, and the macronutrients, vitamins, minerals, proteins. You're going to have to take your vitamin D in Alberta. I'm sorry, you're in Northern Canada. You want to have a diet that ultimately you'll enjoy in the long term, right? So you work towards figuring out how to do that. You don't have to figure that one out overnight. And gut health, the microbiome, super important. We'll talk about that later. Okay, next. This is the shocking stuff for me. I've just been reading about this in the last month. It's like, oh my, I did not understand this. So the last 50, 60 years, essentially the food industry has created this kind of iterative cycle of trying to maximize their profit by maximizing consumption. How do you do that? You make the food addictive, which is basically soft and energy dense, sugar, salt, fat, right? So they're, they're designing so that you will eat more and spend more. And at the same time, they're making the products cheaper. I heard of uh, shrinkflation and I forget the other one was like, when they change the like chocolate into palm oil and stuff like that, where it's, it's cheaper products and it's not as healthy for you. But anyways, so then your marketing, like almost every package you see, oh, like low in fiber or whatever, low in salt and all that stuff. That's really a, probably a red flag to say it's, it's an ultra processed food, right? And so it's the whole process. They're designing, they're engineering, they're testing, they're looking at market share, they're trying to maximize profit. It's just big industry. Uh, we need to support the, the healthy stuff. The Nova classification was designed by a Brazilian a scientist who noticed that even though people in Brazil were eating the same types of food as they had eaten for you know, 100 years, there was a, uh, an obesity epidemic in the 1990s. And what had happened was the food companies were using ultra-processed foods. Uh, and so he... He was the one, Guerrera, who, who kind of published this. It's okay to eat any of these first three categories, really, uh, biggest picture, right? Usually up to two to three ingredients, whole uh, foods best. The fourth category is a whole other category. It's whole other food-like substance um, that I'm going to explain in a moment. We really need to stay away from, from this stuff. Okay, so... What is an ultra processed food like substance? Essentially, they're using extracts. So they're like putting through the, the grain through multiple extractions or you know, uh, uh, an oil and extracting certain elements of, uh, of those products or you know, butter or those type of things. So the extractions, you lose the, the positive micronutrients and it kind of changes oftentimes the structure. You can recognize an ultra processed food because it's chemicals that you wouldn't have in your pantry essentially in your kitchen. And if you can't make it at home, you're probably not, uh, it's probably not good for you. Emulsifiers, for instance, preserves emulsifier essentially uh, allows the, the food to kind of stay soft. It's kind of binding between the, uh, the kind of the fat and the water type thing. And so it actually rips out the lining of your gut is what is an emulsifier doing. 
right? So all the super, almost all the super supermarket breads have these products and they're not good for you. The breakfast cereals, not good for you. Most yogurts, energy bars, not good for you. Food wrapped in plastic, not good for you. Yes, I'm exaggerating. Yes, there can be a place for all this. You don't have to be perfect. I'm just saying that really we need to stay away more from ultra processed foods. Why? Why is that true? It's well, and this is how you recognize it. So we're not looking at the macronutrients up top. Two foods can have the same macronutrients. One of them will be ultra processed food like substance. One won't be. But look at this. <laughs> look at this one. Uh, azodicarbonamide ADA. How about that? I'm sure that's healthy for me. This all these conditioners and enzymes and preservatives. This is not good for you. Sorry to be ranting, guys, but it's, it's this is important for you to kind of understand. Canada Food Guide starting to update that. So especially the sugary stuffs, right? The sugary jams, chocolates, candies, but even almost all the ice creams now are designed for distribution. And so it will stay at the right kind of texture in the long term. And here's a product that I had uh, had um, taken a picture of from Amazon. And then it kind of blew up the, you know, the gums and the, what's this, Carrageenan? Jinyan. Anyways, at least they're honest. Contains bioengineered food ingredients. I'm not so sure that their logo great quality actually qualifies uh, in this situation. So be careful, read the ingredients. What's the issue? So in the Canada, it's probably 50, 60% of our caloric uh, uptake. In kids, again, you have an opportunity to have an influence on your kids and grandkids to try to get them away from uh, these food-like substances. The problem is, along with their social media, the anxiety and depression uh, on that side. Okay, the problem is it contributes to poor mental health. Our brains are not used to the inflammatory products that into our gut, leaves those chemicals up to the brain. The brain, de brain doesn't respond as well. And it's associated with cancer. Again, if something's associated with cancer after a diagnosis, you want to stay away from it. Alzheimer's, neurodegenerative disease, right? You do look, we none of us want to have those kind of extra hits in our brain tissue, lots of other conditions there. That's the issue, trying to stay away from that. This is a super interesting study. This is one of the kind of hallmark studies from about three years ago. They took 20 uh, overweight adults and kept them, essentially locked them up and counted their calories and exactly what they ate for 28 days. They were randomized. Half of them got the healthy diet for the first two weeks. Half of them got the ultra processed food diet for two weeks. And then they switched over. And um, uh, so it wasn't like, it wasn't just like, you know, chips and pop in one side and uh, celery and uh, broccoli in the other side. It was, uh, they actually had similar types of foods, but the foods were prepared in a certain way. And so they added some more uh, fiber to the ultra processed side. They added some more fruit to get some more sugar. So they balanced the the two diets uh, between the two. So they they are matched in calorie density, macronutrients, fiber side of things. So interestingly, they, they when they were the patients that were going through this trial, they felt the same feelings of satiety. So they felt full after eating, and they enjoyed the food to the same same degree. So it's not like they liked one more than the other. They liked both of them. This is the takeaway. The ultra processed food group ate 500 K cows more per day. Wow. And they gained two pounds over two weeks compared with the healthy group losing two pounds over two weeks. We don't know exactly why it's true. It's probably because it's so calorie dense that you don't get the the calories don't get into your system fast enough to let your brain know that you're actually full and you end up overeating. Uh, there may be some influence on the appetite as well through these different chemicals. All I can say is there's the science. It's not healthy uh, for you. So, and the other part of it is probably partly mediated through our microbiome. So that's the hundred trillion bacteria in your gut that are so incredibly important to your health. Um, right, they're doing so much for you. They're the ones who are leaving a lot of these positive chemicals. If you irritate your gut, you're irritating your immune system. But the ultra processed foods, as I said before, can strip off that single layer of cells and cause kind of leaky gut syndrome, 
the chemicals get into the system, the immune system gets flared up. You have all those inflammatory chemicals. Remember, like a cold, why do you feel tired with a cold? Because your immune system is getting flared up and sending signals up to your brain to say, relax, be tired, give us more energy. Same thing is happening if you're eating this stuff. And the problem is you're not getting enough fiber as well. And so really it changes the uh, the ecosystem. You want to have a nice, healthy, diverse forest of bacteria in your gut and the ultra processed foods are not allowing that to happen. This, like this, this is uh, the root of many, many issues is the inflammatory response in your gut health. Okay, let's get on to things that you can really control. Okay, so time-restricted eating. I don't like using the word fasting. It sounds like you're denying yourself of something. So it's not just what you eat, but when you eat, the content can be the same. And the science is, we want you to go through this cycle of having a, a glucose or sugar in your system and then having ketones in your system, which is kind of the fat breakdown. So you want to go through glycoses and ketoses through a 24-hour cycle. That's the healthiest cycle. So it's not a ketogenic diet. It's the cycling and especially giving your non-eating uh, part of it uh, the time it deserves. So um, once you eat food, you get the storage, you get sugar in your bloodstream, the fatty acids go to the cells. When you're not eating, that sugar gets kind of used up, the liver gets drained of its glycogen, and ultimately you start processing your fat, producing ketones, which you want to do. You want to get into that phase every 24 hours. Why? Because that really improves cell function, right? So you're more resistant to the stress, like literally to the stress, but also you eat up the little dead cells or the small cells or the weak cells and all the little debris. You're, you're kind of doing your cleanup during that phase and you're really settling down the inflammation and you're allowing your gut to heal. So all super important stuff. Every cell is on the cell cycle and that's why we want to eat during the day and we don't want to eat at night. And if you just do that, your blood sugars and your insulin levels and the fat and blood pressure, all that gets better. So as a takeaway for each and every one of you, try not to eat the two or three hours prior to going to sleep. And then for the first hour upon awaking, do not eat. Yes, you can drink your coffee or tea as long as there's no calories in it, no sugar or milk during that time. And then you can slowly train yourself over a number of months to slowly get better and better and better at doing this. So again, it's not one of the things that you have to do immediately. You can kind of break yourself into it. But the idea is to get into ketosis at least for a few hours. You want to get into the hungry phase for a few hours every 24 hours, which usually means not eating for at least 12 to 14 hours. Now, as you start to do this, you will have the hungries or the hangries, uh, right? So you're waking up and just feeling a little more irritable or headache or constipated or whatever. But again, your body will adapt and those short-term symptoms should settle. Right, So it's normal, it's expected, you will adapt, your body will get better at it. Here's why, right? So we didn't understand, but your heart actually makes a recovery, your kidneys, there's different, your gut, it, it, it actually allows you to lose some weight, helps prevent cancer, well, probably through immune function, and stimulates brain function. Again, there's back to your brain again. Can you get your brain feeling better? Okay, next one, I'm going to zip through a little bit more why we sleep. Uh, and I don't want you feeling stressed about it. It's like, it's this feeling of true self-care, self-love. I love myself and I'm going to do what I can to get a better night's sleep, not a perfect night's sleep. The issue is if you're awake for a long, well, as soon as you're awake, you're getting, bring up some toxins into your brain. And there's what they call the lymphatic system that kind of flushes out those metabolites or the, the chemicals that build up during uh, during the waking hour. So that's what you do in the early part of the night. The later part of the night, interesting, is around kind of REM sleep and memories and uh, emotional processing. Uh, interesting, it's almost like doing like self-psychotherapy there. The takeaway is you, know, you know what you, is best for you, but unless you test it seven to nine hours per night, this is just the idea that you get this kind of flush out through the uh, the different systems in the body. And if we don't give ourselves that required sleep, we put ourselves at risk of cancer. 
too much weight, weak immune system, all sorts of things. Again, if it's a risk of cancer, then you don't want to do that after you get a cancer diagnosis. And our mental health takes a true hit. We're much more irritable. We slip our lid more easily um, when we do that. Always see an expert if they're like if this is a major problem. I don't. I I would say that for any issue, right? To go see your family doctor and so on. I'm not going to go through the circadian rhythm just to recognize that every cell in your body is set up on this cycle. You get that deep restorative sleep at the start of the night, some REM sleep there, and then you usually at your best in the morning. Don't want to drink your caffeine too late. There's the cycles. So habits, think about this as an integrated perspective. So we're decreasing stress levels, which is our perception of how much threat is out there. By doing these things that we're talking about, reframing meditation, training yourself to fall asleep more easily by creating the conditions for a good night's sleep. Number one is routine, getting to bed at the same time, uh, uh, getting up at the same time. So even setting your alarm uh, 40 or 15 minutes before I have to go to sleep, write down your worries, same time, get up, see some light, reset your clock every morning. We want to avoid the screen time, right? The television news, the horror films, avoid the exercising, big, big meal. So you're setting up your whole schedule to take care of yourself. Caffeine has a half-life of five to eight hours. Right. So two half days later, 10 to 16 hours later, still got a quarter of a cup of coffee in your system. Alcohol sleeping pills do not help you get good sleep. They might help you fall asleep, but this is not the answer to uh, positive sleep. You want to mimic the sun by dimming using uh, blue light blockers if need be for the last couple of hours. I like to use a dark shade at night. Um, and then first thing in the morning, getting the bright light, even looking out the window, like you don't have to go outside, just looking out the window gives you that spectrum of light there. Ideal uh, conditions, cooler because your body actually has to drop uh, its core temperature by a couple of degrees, but you want to feel kind of comfortable. If you have insomnia um, after about 20 minutes, probably need to leave that room because you want to associate your bedroom with a place where you sleep practice relaxation technique or peaceful activity. Really, this is about kindness. How do you talk to yourself at night? Um, yes, this is tough, but I can function well enough tomorrow. I'll do my best to sleep in the days come. I can do it. It's like So being both pragmatic and you know, uh, encouraging. Melatonin, I wouldn't recommend it as an ongoing basis. There may be chronic uh, side effects. You can use it if you're traveling, for instance. Naps, I do agree that naps, just changing, you know, having a you know, 15 minute nap before, for instance, 2 p.m. can actually change the biochemistry within your brain, allow you to function better. If there's enough data there. Practicing a relaxation technique. I just want to touch onto this one just briefly, but it's this long, slow, smooth out breath. In fact, why don't we just do that one right now? Breathing in. Breathing out nice and slow. Breathing in for a count of three or four. Breathing out for a count of six to eight. Breathing in. Breathing out. I was listening to an Andrew, you can relax again. I was listening to Andrew Wheel. Um, he's saying this breathing, uh, was it three, four, seven? Uh, so breathing in for a count of three, holding for a count of four, and breathing smoothly out for a count of seven. So three, four, seven. You do that four times over in the morning and the evening. Even a month later, it's a resetting of the kind of uh, stress what they call the stressometer, your kind of baseline stress uh, level. The data is very clear. You enervate that left prefrontal lobe. You're able to uh, be more compassionate, emotional regulation, better immune function, less inflammation in your body. 
I mean, it's, it's just like, it's obvious. Again, it's something that you can tap. You actually change your brain by doing that activity. So again, um, and I like that combination of a little bit of mindful meditation, even 10 minutes in the morning, set your aspirations, set your intention. You can even do it in the evening just before you go to bed. I think that's really important as well. You can settle down the, uh, the body Maybe think of something that you're grateful about, and that will actually change your ability to sleep, change the quality of your sleep, right? It doesn't have to be you know, perfectly meditation or there's different you know, body scans, qigong, but it's this idea. You guys can do this with me right now. So just stand up for a second and just breathing in and breathing out. Bring your mindfulness breathing in in through your nose and out through your mouth, bring your mindfulness. Watch, pay attention. And when your mind wanders, bring your attention back to the activity. And out. Right? So it, it doesn't have to be stagnant. You could do it as a walking meditation. You can do that as yoga, but isn't like relaxation technique is not taking a bath. It's it's actually a technique in which you focus your uh, attention on an object and recognizing that you're going to get you know there's going to be stuff happening in your mind and so on. But it's the muscle of coming back, the muscle of remembering. Okay, this is the technique I'm working on. So you're getting better at coming back home. You're getting better at focusing. You practice that over time. That's why it's called the meditation practice. Lots of really positive uh, physical effects, right? So I'm, see I'm seeing the second one from the bottom, decrease the cortisol, which is one of the kind of stress hormones by simply doing a relaxation breath technique that empowers the immune function. You change your brain, the neural structure, the how the brain wires itself. Insula, interesting. So interoception is the capacity to watch what's happening within your body. What does it feel like right now? Internally, what's happening there? And that is good for self-awareness, but it's also uh, is reflected in mirror neurons. When I do that, I'm better able to perceive the emotions of other people because I'm actually mirroring those emotions. Hippocampus is around... Uh, uh, memory and our alarm system, prefrontal cortex, right? You're thickening your brain, the higher executive fun functions, planning, decision-making, attention, all those things, right? And so left side is improving mood, less breakdown of the tissues. And then physiological. So you have less cortisol in the system, better immune function, better able to heal from your treatments. And then Ultimately, you practice this and your brain starts to adapt. So it's the better um, better version of you. If you're paying more attention to what's actually happening, right? So improved attention, uh, compassion. You're more compassionate. I know I'm more compassionate and empathetic in the days that I meditate and less of the, of the issues. You're less likely to get caught up in the loops that are not helpful less chance of relapsing from depression. That's, it's just the science. You're like, it's your, your brain is in a different space. Your perceptions of the world are in a different space because you're seeing differently and you're happier, just generally speaking. I want to, I want to offer you just like a couple more exercises. One of them is this idea of how then to ingrain your habits, how to create habits and I'm just going to tell you BJ Fogg, so another Stanford profs. So our brains are set up for habits, automatization, right? The cue is it's noon. I'm going to go to the cafeteria. I'm going to hang out with my friends. That's what happens. And we get better and better and better at that. So we're tapping into the reward system. And what BJ Fogg is saying is if you want to create a new habit or new habits, start with just one habit and make it super easy. That's really the kind of the takeaway. So for us, we're going to do a uh, walking. You want to get into a walking regimen? 
then you promise yourself, I'm only going to walk, I only have to walk for two minutes and that'll be it. Or for me, it's like, I'm going to take my vitamin D and that's going to be my new habit. So I'm going to visualize exactly what I'm going to do. For you who are walking, I'm going to put on my shoes. I'm going to walk out the front door. I'm going to walk down the street. I'm going to come back again. That's my walking routine, right? So it's a two minute walk is the visualization. For me, I'm going to reach for my toothbrush. And as I see my uh, vitamin D and my B12, I'm going to grab those. So this is, this is my setup, right? First thing in the morning, as I'm reaching for my toothbrush, I remember I'm going to grab my vitamin D and B12. And I'm actually pretty good at, at now in grading this one. This graph suggests, I'm not going to take you through the whole graph, that if you go in this spot here where it's super easy to do, like all I have to do is go for a two-minute walk, your motivation doesn't have to be very high and you're still likely to be able to do it. And so BJ Fogg suggests that you have it stack, right? After I walk in the door from work, I'm going to put on my shoes and go for a walk, two minute walk, right? Or after I reach for my toothbrush, I'm going to grab my vitamin D and put it in my mouth. So tiny, easy habit. After I step on the scale, I'll thank God. You know, after I wash my face in the morning, I put on my sunscreen. After my feet hit the floor, I'll say to myself, today will be a great day somehow, right? So that was his somehow, I'm gonna, or am I going to make the best day of this, right? So habit stacking on this side. The reward system, yeah. So it's more important to have a positive emotional state than actually the number of repetitions. So don't believe this you know, new habit in 21 days. It actually has to do with your emotional state related to the habit. And so give yourself that reward at the end of the activity, um, right? So for me, after I grab my vitamin D, I say to myself, woohoo, I'm awesome. Now, it sounds ridiculous that I'm going to celebrate. Yeah, I'm amazing. I just took my vitamin D. Bingo, you know, mini dance on the spot. But my brain will remember that feeling and therefore I'm more likely to ingrain that habit, right? So it's this kind of false happy celebration. Like you can practice the celebration, um, you're more likely to ingrain it with time. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, so to put this all together, creating the walking routine, tiny. What you're going to say is, I'm only going to walk for three minutes to the end of the street and back. And if I do that, that's a huge success. Now, I know that you almost certainly will walk beyond the three minutes, but you're always going to keep your tiny habit level tiny so that when the motivation wanes one day, oh, I don't want to go for my half an hour walk. That's too much, but I can walk to the end of the street back. I know I can do that. Right. And so you're more likely to stay with it ultimately. So look for the cue or the prompt. My key goes in the front door after work, or I step on the stairs first thing in the morning. That's the key. Okay. Boom. Now we're going to um, do the habit. We're going to celebrate sometimes the start and the end. Okay. Yeah. I walked out the front door. Yeah. I'm awesome. I'm walking down the street. I'm going to do a three minute walk. Woohoo. And at the end of the activity, when you come back in the office, you probably went more than three minutes but you're still like, yeah, Rocky at the end of your walk and ultimately can change the attitude. I'm the type of person who walks every day. I'm a power walker. I'm going to skip over the stress part of this. And just to say that when you're anxious and upset, press the pause button, be very curious about the physical sensations in your body. And then we'll just do the four slow breaths again. So you found yourself in a stressful place. You're recognizing that you're stressed. Press the pause button. You don't have to you know, solve all the world's problems in this very moment. Be very curious about the physicality in your body. You can kind of do this with me right now. Four slow breaths again. So this, is, this talk today is about four slow breaths. Slow, smooth out breath. Slightly deeper in breath. Slow, smooth out breath. Slow, smooth out breath. As you're doing that, you're sending a signal up to your brain to say, I'm safe. I can handle this. And then you actually can talk to yourself. You get... Then you're you're getting back into your frontal lobe again. So if you're when the anxiety flares, 
let go of all the catastrophization, become very mindful, watching very carefully, and reassure yourself, I can take this, I can do this, one step at a time. I've been through difficult things before. Now, you're not going to get back to being perfect, but you will feel better than you were before. Okay, and this last piece is this whole idea that you can rewire your brain, the neurons that fire together, wire your brother, and ultimately you can change your brain by practicing these states of mind. So the states then become traits. You become that type of person who is more centered by practicing over time. But you actually have to practice, which is the installation and activation part of that. So you can grow these traits. So I want you to think about um, a trait that you want to build more of, right? Or another way to say that is if you're struggling with something, what's the antidote of that? And we're going to go through this last kind of visualization as the last uh, exercise today. Or you can choose from this list of strengths that you'd like to build more of. Where would you like to be amongst these, these ideas here? Where would you like to be more often? Okay, so choose one state of mind or one inner strength. And um, we're going to do an activity called taking in the good. Okay, again, sitting in your chair. Bring to mind a time when you were in that state of mind, right? When you were... Well, we're, feeling that emotional energy, that kind of sense of strength or that positive value. So bring yourself back to when that was happening. And in fact, as you can close your eyes as you're doing this, I want you to remember where you were. Like, what were you seeing around you? Who was there? Was it an inner space or an outer space? Inside, outside? I want you to kind of relive that moment by remembering how your body felt as well. How did you feel? How did your heart feel? How did your gut feel? What was the energy in your body at that time? What were you thinking? What were the thoughts that were going through your mind? What were the emotions? How would you describe yourself from an emotional perspective? What were the actions? What was what was happening? What was the feeling on your skin? Was it warm or cool? Just generally allow yourself to relive that. Now imagine that as you're experiencing this again, that you're actually absorbing it. You're it's it's consolidating that feeling within your heart. So it's like setting down an emotional imprint into your heart and a pathway within your mind. So the state of mind that you can give yourself right now by remembering and reliving is being imprinted into your body, into your heart. Um, and then you can let go of the kind of sense of visualization and uh, kind of come back and recognize you actually did give yourself that experience. So in order to live more for, with that inner strength, you either um, have those experiences or visualize those experiences. One of those two will allow you to practice it so that when those opportunities come, that you'll be naturally better at doing that. And the other thing is when you do have those experiences, like have the points of peace or joy or calm, then really appreciate it, really enjoy it, really slow down and really taste every aspect of it with every part of your emotion, every part of your psyche so that it actually ingrains. Because otherwise it goes through too quickly and you lose out in the opportunity for your brain to actually set it down. It, it, you don't get the activation and installation part, part of it. So to summarize, taking in the good, you have a good experience meaning you literally you know it happens in your life or you visualize it happening. Number two is you enrich it by really slowing down and appreciating it, right? And as we were visualizing, we're using different aspects of it. So you enrich the experience, you really slow down and really absorb and understand. You, you know, those are the enriching factors. And so 
it's usually at least 15 to 20 seconds with a, a, a reasonable de degree of intense, intensity. And then I think the absorbing piece is more just another way to kind of trick you into staying in it. So it, it was the setting down in your heart or within your psyche. It's like, ah, I'm, I'm allowing this to really sink in. So that prolongs a little bit longer. And then you can use the same technique if you want to link positive and negative material. So for instance, you have a phobia towards um, spiders or elevators or something like that. You can slowly visualize being in a positive state of mind and slowly uh, desensitizing yourself there. So that's, that's uh, taking in the good, right? So it's another way to kind of set down the pathway uh, where you're more likely to stay in that positive state of mind. So heal, have, enrich, absorb, and potentially link uh, those experiences. I'm just going to do a quick pitch for the patient, Sir Cancer Patient Empowerment Program. So it's a program that's actually available uh, right now. You can go to cancerpep.com. So every day for six months, we're going to offer you a daily email and a four-minute video, five-minute video for myself and my wife, who's a psychology professor, that will um, teach you how, like a, a lot of these, uh, the, the, the diet, the um, psychological stuff, it's all kind of embedded as a kind of ongoing teaching throughout. And so there's strength training, there's dietary advice. We teach you every aspect of the program, including habit formation. I didn't go through the stress reduction, relationship teaching, et cetera, et cetera. Opportunity for a buddy system, Zoom, monthly Zoom conferences with us. So it's organic and ongoing. So cancerpep.com. Get a good deal. Let us, you can send me an email. Uh, you can uh, cancerpep.com. Uh, we can get you signed up for a good deal. So there's me, Nikki. I'm hoping I didn't go too, 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 too far over time. Uh, but Rob, 